You're listening to the Gospel of Mark, a series preached by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. I'm glad to be back in the book of Mark this evening. It's been a little while since we've been here, uh, and I, I've loved the book of Mark. It's been a fantastic, it is a fantastic gospel. Uh, hopefully it'll continue to be. <laughs> um, but in Mark chapter 8, we are confronted with a story that, for me, was challenging, instructive, and encouraging. And so that I hope tonight as we study, it will be at least one of those things for you as well. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of speaking to someone who you know has heard the gospel time and time again, right? They have been clearly instructed in what the gospel is, but if you were to ask them, can you tell me what the gospel is, they would look at you like you have three eyes. Like, well, what do you mean? What is the gospel? That's a crazy question. How could anybody ask a question like that? I have no clue. And you're just trying to figure out how that's possible. I heard a story about some preachers who were talking about the fact that they used to believe that there was no other church in their city that ever preached the gospel because people would come from all different churches and then come to their church and say, this is the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs> Until they heard from one of the other pastors that somebody came from their church and went there and said, this is the first time I've ever heard the gospel. And it was like, well, no, you've been hearing it every single day, every single week for years, but you just didn't hear it. And I'm sure if you've ever tried to do ministry before, you've spoken to people who, when you talk about spiritual things, it seems like their eyes gloss over. In fact, we haven't actually opened the Bible yet, and some of you are already there. (laughs) Kidding, I think. But this is the job, this is the task that we take on when we take on ministry, to recognize that it's a spiritual battle and that people are blinded to the gospel that they willfully don't hear the gospel, that they don't want to hear about a God who is their judge, a God that they'll answer to, that they choose to be the Lord of their own lives, and so they don't hear what's being said. In our story, we will find Jesus confronted with a few people who are just like this. The end of the seventh chapter of Mark, we find Jesus healing a man who is deaf and dumb. He's unable to speak well. And it's interesting that Mark follows that story of physical deafness and physical dumbness with a story about people who are spiritually deaf and and then clearly dumb. They don't hear what's being said. And I want to present to you that this problem of spiritual deafness This problem of not hearing what the Word of God is saying and not applying it to our lives is a much greater problem than physical deafness, right? We are always confronted with physical needs right in front of us. But I think that we fail to recognize the deep spiritual needs that are all around us all the time. Even the spiritual needs in our own lives come second place to, I'm hungry and I need a snack. There's a book called Screwtape Letters. It's written by C.S. Lewis. And he's speaking as a demon, instructing another demon. And one of the things that this uncle demon is constantly telling the, the demon in training is that all you need to do when a spiritual thought comes into someone's mind is to redirect them to some kind of physical need oh, well, that's, that's really nice that you're thinking these spiritual thoughts, but wouldn't it be better to do that on a full stomach? It's getting about 11. It's about time for that first snack. Oh, look at all these things going on around you all the time. It's so easy for us to be distracted by the physical needs around us and miss what's spiritual. And this is exactly what's happening to these people in the story in front of us today. We'll be covering quite a few verses tonight, and so I want to break that down. Verses 1 to 9 of Mark chapter 8 will be Jesus and the people. Verses 10 to 13 is Jesus and the Pharisees. And the verses 14 to 21, we will see Jesus and his disciples. 
I want to assume something from the get-go. And that is, first of all, that any lack of understanding on the part of the disciples, the Pharisees, or the people was not a result of Jesus' inability to communicate effectively. He is a perfect teacher, so it wasn't his fault. And it's not a problem with the message. And so there's something else going on inside those people that is the problem. As much as we like to do it, we can't just blame the speaker or the bad message. Here, it is the people that are the problem. So pay attention to the way that the different groups of people respond to Jesus. We'll look at Mark chapter 8, verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for diverse of them came from very far. Does this story, as we begin, sound familiar to you? It should if you were here a few months ago when we covered Mark chapter 6. Right? There's a very similar story found in Mark 6 about Jesus confronted with a group of people who have been with him for a long period of time and are now hungry and them needing food before they go home. Here, Jesus is the one who finds this need. I think it's actually interesting that when he first came to the, the group of people in Mark chapter 6, when he had compassion on them, his compassion was directed toward their spiritual need. They needed to be fed. So he spent the whole day feeding them spiritually, and it came to the end of the day and said, oh, they probably should eat something too. And it was the disciples that brought up the food. This time, it's Jesus that brings up their, their food. Why is he concerned about their physical need? Well, because he spent all day feeding them spiritually, first of all. And second of all, he's not concerned that they're a little bit hungry. And I think actually this was helpful for me to see. Jesus was concerned that they had a long trip home. Some of them had come days journeys and they'd been with him for three days and they might not make it home. And so what I'm learning from this is that Jesus is concerned about our physical needs. Not as concerned as I am after I've skipped one meal though right? He's concerned about our physical needs when they come to the point of no longer living, not making it home. Then he wants to take care of them. And so here Jesus sees this need and he, he points it out and he decides he's going to do something about it. Now in Mark chapter 6, Jesus had planned a retreat for his disciples. When they arrived at their destination, the, the group caught up to them and they formed a greeting party. And so you can imagine the disciples are upset at this. They arrive and all of a sudden their vacation is ruined because the people are all there. But Jesus has compassion and he teaches them. He sees them as a shepherd without, or as a sheep without shepherd. And so he shepherds them. In that story, we learned so many lessons. We learned that we should praise the Lord for his provision, that he does provide for us. We learned that faith in Jesus, even when we don't see the end of his plan, is always well-placed faith. Okay? The disciples didn't have the faith at that time. They didn't put the faith in Jesus, but they didn't see the end of his plan. He told them to have everybody sit down in groups of 150, and they're going, what's going on? How much food do you have? Well, we have five little loaves and two fish. That's not enough to feed this many people, clearly. And so they have no clue what's going on. But faith in Jesus is always well-placed faith. They didn't need to see the end to obey. We also found that the smallest offering is significant when given to Christ. That Jesus chooses to use his disciples to deliver the miracle of the bread and fish to others. I love that. That Jesus used people to take the miracle that he had just accomplished and put it in the hands of other people just sounds so much like what we're supposed to do with the gospel. Take the truth, the miracle that Christ has died for sinners and put it in the hands of other people. More significant than that, we learned that the need of the people was much greater than they ever imagined. That they showed up because they wanted to see a spectacle. They were there because they were hoping that they would see Jesus do something worth watching, do an amazing miracle. And they didn't see themselves as sheep without a shepherd. 
But that's what they were. Their need was much greater than they imagined. We also found that Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. He fed them both physically and spiritually. Now Mark begins telling another story that is eerily familiar to this one. So, either he is a poor storyteller, or he got mixed up and he's telling the same story twice, or he has a purpose to including this story, and that purpose is building upon the first. You can probably guess which one I think it is. Right? I don't think that Mark is just mistaken or that he's just not very good at telling stories and is including the same event twice. I think what's happening here is there was a purpose to that first event. He was teaching some things there. And now this time he's going to build on that. So the great multitude is being taught by Jesus. This time he has compassion on them because they're hungry, because they haven't eaten for a long time. And so they've been three days without food, and before he sends them home, he wants to make sure they're going to make it. Verse number four. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men without bread in the wilderness? Okay. Again, this is the same question. How is this possible, Jesus? Don't you know where we are? We're in the middle of the desert, middle of the wilderness. There's no place that we can feed these people. What I want to know is, who is the spokesman here? Who was it? it you, probably Peter, because he always, you know, had a foot-shaped mouth. I wonder if, like, a couple of disciples had this conversation, and one of them came forward and said it, and there's a couple guys in the back going, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like, why are you asking that question again? Do you remember what happened last time? I wonder how Jesus looked at that disciple in the moment that he spoke. Do you ever think about how the, how the story played out? Like, the, the guy asked the question, well, Jesus, where are we going to find any food? And then a couple of disciples are in the back going, you just asked that question again? And Jesus is looking at, really? <laughs> really? Like, where? Do you remember anything? Apparently not. Verse 5, and he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and he gave thanks, and he break, and he gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set, before, set them before the people. And then a few small fishes, and he blessed, and he commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. So Jesus takes the seven loaves of bread and the small fish and feeds 4,000 people. Matthew is more specific. He makes, us, makes it known that there were 4,000 men plus women and children. And these people eat, and they are filled, fully filled satisfied. I like that part, that Jesus doesn't ever provide a meal that doesn't satisfy. Often he is the one providing the meal, physical meals in the Gospels, and it's never recorded that there was an extra. I love that, right? Because he's going to be feeding me for eternity. <laughs> and so there are seven baskets of food remaining, this is an amazing miracle, and we could spend time speaking about the power of Christ and his ability to multiply the food, his creative power. But we've done that last time. And like I said, I think that we're building on the last lesson here. And so let's be amazed by Jesus who did this amazing miracle, and then let's continue. Verse number 10. Here is Jesus and the Pharisees. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples, and he came to the parts of Dal Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall be no sign given unto this generation. And he left them, and he entered into the ship again and departed to the other side. You don't perform miracles like Jesus was without people hearing about it. 
and the Pharisees, once again, had heard about it. No doubt, many of them had seen. And so they came to Jesus as well. But they didn't come to Jesus with a desire to learn. They didn't come to Jesus with an ounce of humility. They didn't come to Jesus because they sensed any kind of need within themselves. They came because they wanted him to perform for them. And I think the rest of the Gospels makes it clear that they came because they wanted to find a way to discredit him. And so they come to Jesus just like everybody else. And in some cases, they have the same face on. They say, Jesus, teach us. Jesus, show us. Show us a miracle. Show us who you are and we'll believe. But their attitude is completely different. Their state of mind is that they're content with their own righteousness. They have no need within. They don't need to be saved. They don't see their sin. And if they do, it's not a problem. They have it covered. And they were certainly not prepared for a Savior who demanded their repentance from their self-righteousness and demanded authority in their lives. They were their own authority. They were comfortable with their authority. And they had their own righteousness. Notice the way that Jesus responds to the people who come to him with this attitude. Verse 12, he sighs deeply in his spirit. Why would Mark record a sigh? Like, you're, you're telling the history of the God-man. And you're speaking about miracles and people being raised from the dead and then these amazing messages that he's giving. And then at, at some points, he records these odd details like he sighed. Who cares? But that sigh gives us such a window into the emotions that Jesus felt. That he was distraught at their lack of faith. That he was grieved by their pride and their self-righteousness. That all of his emotions are bubbling over here into a sigh that Jesus lets out before he says, why does this generation seek after a sign? There's no sign going to be given to you people. He didn't send them away. He left them. There's a lot of times that Jesus has spoken to people and he's taught people. And when he's done, he says, God bless you. Good night. He sends them away. But it is a scary thing when Jesus leaves. It's a completely different scenario here. He, he's warned them and now he's told them, you get nothing. And he walks away. Now, here's the amazing thing about Christ. Did the Pharisees have every chance to respond to the gospel? Did they have every chance to follow Jesus and know him? Yes, they did, right? But the sin that seemed to close the door faster than any other sin was that sin of pride and self-righteousness. And that's what the Pharisees wore. They, they almost wore it. Like they were so good and they knew it and everybody knew it. And that was enough. And it's just not ever enough. And so Jesus sighs. He groans. He lets out his emotions and then he, and then he leaves. Now we come to the exciting part. <laughs> because now Jesus and his disciples are going to talk about what just happened. Verse number 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. So they've got, they've got enough food for them to each have a bite, right? And they're upset about it. And so I can imagine one of them saying, dude, who forgot the bread? We had seven baskets full. Like, what's going on? Where is all the food? And so they're having this conversation. And Jesus says, he charges them in verse 15, saying, take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because, because we have no bread. Okay, so now I'm going to apologize to all the blonde people here. <laughs> but this is the blondest moment in the Bible. <laughs> like, Jesus, you just got off the shore. And Jesus just took five loaves and little fishes 
and fed 4,000 plus people, and you had seven baskets full, and now you've got one loaf and 12 people, 13 people, and you're super worried about not having another meal. So much so that when Jesus gives this like obvious discussion about the leaven of the Pharisees and, the, and Herod, immediately you go to, yeah, the, yeah, leaven, that's in bread. <laughs> and we're hungry. So he must be talking about some special kind of leaven, leaven that only the religious leaders and Herod know about, right? Like, what is he thinking? What are they thinking? <laughs> Again, I wonder how that conversation went. I wonder if one of them said, maybe it's because we forgot to bring bread. And, and instead of like correcting him and saying, hey, moron, <laughs> that's a ridiculous idea. Like, obviously, that's not what he's talking about. They all say, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> so that's what they'd go with. Meanwhile, Jesus is sitting on the side of the boat, reading their minds. <laughs> so scary. Verse 17, and when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why reason ye because you have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand. Have you your heart yet hardened? Having eyes you see not, having ears you hear not, and you do not remember. When I broke the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said unto them, how is it that you do not understand? This is one of the greatest condemnations in scripture that Jesus offers his disciples. He is severely correcting them. He asks loads of questions here designed for them to see how blind and hard-hearted and deaf and irrational they are, right? Why do you think? Why do you think that it's because we don't have bread? Are, are you serious? Do you not see? Can you not understand? Is your heart so hard? Are your eyes, have they completely stopped working? Can you hear nothing? Do you not remember what just happened? Don't you remember the 5,000? Don't you remember the 4,000? How much do we have then? And you think, like, this is not me that's saying that, that the disciples were being foolish. This is Jesus saying, what is up, guys? How is this even possible? How are you possibly so dense that you think that I'm worried about lunch? And so, Jesus corrects them fairly seriously. And in the process, he encourages me, he challenges me, and I think he instructs all of us. And so, I want to look at those three things, how this story is challenging, informative, and corrective for me, and hopefully for you as well. We'll begin with how it's informative, okay? We spoke about this already. Jesus is the perfect teacher. The message that he's giving is perfect. At this moment, he is frustrated by the lack of comprehension, comprehension that his disciples have. And he addresses their rationale. It's broken. They're not thinking well. They're hearing. They're seeing. Their ability to remember. And their hard heart. We have all been in situations where clear teaching from the Bible was ignored, misunderstood, twisted, rejected, or quickly forgotten. If you raise children, I'm sure this happens to you often. You teach your kids something, and what you say is twisted, rejected, quickly forgotten, misunderstood, or ignored all the time. If you have an employee, you've experienced this. You tell them something, they don't get it. If you have a husband, I was going to say wife, but I decided to be smart. <laughs> if you've ever tried to disciple a person, uh, this happens all the time. And this situation is compounded 
exponentially when we're speaking about the realm of spiritual truth. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is an enemy against God. So in these passages, we're learning that first of all, the the natural man, the man without the spirit of God, everything that's said that is spiritual just goes right over here. It, It just, they can't get it because only the spirit can teach these things. They are foolishness without the spirit of God. And then we find that the carnal mind, that fleshly mind, It is death. How is it death? Because it's an enemy against God. Everything that's godly, everything that's good that's said, it naturally rejects. It naturally ignores. It naturally twists. It's going to do everything it can to get around anything spiritual and good and and true that the gospel has for the natural mind. Right? I don't think we think about this, but do you realize that when you're giving the gospel to anybody, that everything in them, to their core, to their nature rejects everything you're saying. And so the work that we're called to, it's not, it's not just a, just a matter of presenting a philosophy of life that's better than the one they currently have. Most people know that they're messed up. That's why everybody's buying self-help books, right? Everybody loves the idea of somebody who's for them, who's going to give them eternal life. Like all of those things seem, all those things seem really good and grand. Why is it so hard? Because people don't get it. Because they don't see, they don't hear, they twist, they reject. Because they have their flesh. And so Jesus, the perfect teacher, teaches the perfect message to his disciples. Twice. I I think that part of the reason that Mark records this story twice is because he wants them to see, he wants us to see, that Jesus had taught a lesson for them. They had a chance to get it and a chance the second time to respond well. So when Jesus says, how much food do you have? Well, Jesus, we have way too much food. This time we have seven loaves. Last time we had five, right? I mean, this time there's only 4,000 people. Last time you fed 5,000, we have 12 baskets left. So I don't know, you probably need one or two of these. But they didn't do anything like that. They're still wondering, how are you going to get food? Right? They, they mess that up. And then he shows them again about how powerful he is and how great he is and how and how they can trust him with everything, and they get on the boat, and they have one, bre- one loaf of bread, and they're worried about food again. Right? They're not getting it time and time again. We learn that ba- sometimes banging our heads against a wall is kind of what Jesus did. It's kind of what ministry is at times. It seems like we're banging our head against a brick wall. Eventually, the Holy Spirit by the help of the Holy Spirit, hopefully that wall will break down. And so, I think this is informative. It shows us that Jesus, the perfect teacher, is teaching a perfect message and people aren't getting it. And Jesus is frustrated by it, right? I mean, their lack of understanding is amazing to them. And if you have ever tried to pour truth into somebody else and and you felt like, what's going on? How is it possible you're not getting it? You're in good company. The second thing here is that it's encouraging. It's encouraging to think that Jesus feels what I feel at times. That ministry can be really discouraging. Even if you're not being paid for it. Even if you're not a pastor. If you're not in full-time ministry, you know that ministry can be very discouraging. Parenting can be very discouraging. A marriage can be very discouraging. Life can be very discouraging. Relation, I mean, it all can be really difficult. And I don't think it's just the physical hardship, right? A lot of times we talk about, you know, thank God that there's no persecution. And I am thankful that there's no physical persecution. But I don't think that means that it's easy. I don't think that means that our spiritual lives are automatically easier just because we get to meet here. I think that it presents a new set of problems. And and it, it allows us to get comfortable in this life and not realize the spiritual battle all around us, right? We don't need to long for eternity. 
We, we don't need the urgency that other people have because there's nothing pushing us toward it, right? We can be comfortable here, and so longing for eternity, oh yeah, I'll, I'll take it when it comes, but I'm quite happy now. Now, believers that are persecuted probably feel like they, they'd love heaven to come now. Often suffering is the thing that opens our eyes to our need or our passion for eternity. So, as I feel discouraged, and I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but thought maybe it's just not, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe I'm not cut out for this line of work. Maybe if, if just ministry is more successful, I'd feel better. I feel like I was doing fine. If everybody was listening, if, if it, it actually seemed like what you're saying is making a difference in people's lives, then maybe you'd be okay. And then I thought of something I read about Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham was probably numerically the most successful preacher of all time. He said, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, Oh God, forgive me, or oh God, help me. And so ministry for Billy Graham was discouraging at times. And then I came across this prayer this week, and it was by Augustine. He said, God of our life, there are days when the burdens we carry chafe our shoulders and weigh us down, when the road seems Sorry, when the road seems endless and the skies gray and threatening, when our lives have no music in them and our hearts are lonely and our souls have lost their courage. Flood the path with light. Run our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. Tune our hearts to the brave music. Give us a sense of camaraderie ship with heroes and saints of every age. And so quicken our spirits that we may be able to encourage the souls of all who journey with us on this road of life to your honor and glory. See, Augustine felt the discouragement. He felt the times when life was really difficult and people weren't listening and and even he wasn't getting it like he should. And he went to God and he begged God for help. And so this is encouraging to me because it's a reminder that, that all people who attempt ministry for God, that we're in a battle, and sometimes it feels like you're losing, and sometimes it is really difficult. Sometimes there seems to be no results, and sometimes the people that you thought were doing great are just not. And so it's a struggle. There's frustration over the fact that we seem to be unable to effectively communicate the truth that our hearts so desperately need, that our hearers so desperately need. And it's common among all those who minister, even Jesus. Can you imagine what it was like for the God-man to deal with those fishermen? Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus to go through just this difficulty of them not getting it over and over again? Well, I'm sure you can, because I'm sure you felt it. But, this leads me to my last point, I wonder how often Jesus feels that way about me. And so this is where it was challenging. I was challenged this week to listen better. I remember when I first trusted Christ my Savior, and I was 16 years old, and and I sat in a church, and uh, the church didn't have the same quality of preaching that we do here at Maple City. Um, had godly godly men that were in the church, godly ladies in the church. It, it, church loved the Lord. Um, but even then, and then going to conferences and going to camps, I remember sitting under the Word of God and feeling as though God was speaking to me through His Word. I wonder if you've sensed that in the past, that you've heard a message and it felt like God was using His Word to teach you something. And I thought, that doesn't happen as often as it used to. Why is that? I mean, you know, you come and you agree with what's being said, 
and you know it's right and true, but why isn't it that I feel like God is using his word to teach something to me specifically, often enough? And so I was challenged to beg God to help me, to help me to listen more intentionally, to try to see where that truth really should be changing my life. Because I don't want to be the disciples forever, right? The great thing about the disciples, here's the the hopefulness that we have, that eventually they got it. Right? They grew, they did better, and sometimes they fell again, and then they did better, and they did better, and they fell, and they did better. And that hopefully is the, the trajectory of our lives. But we've got to start listening. We've got to start obeying the Word of God. This is not just a problem that is true for unbelievers. Right? Yes, there is something special with unbelievers. They don't have the Spirit of God, but I think it's all also true. And I think James is writing to believers in his book, and he's saying, in James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. In other words, it's possible to listen to the word of all, all the time. And because you're not practicing, you're not, putting, you're not doing it every day, you're deceiving yourself. You think you're growing. You think you're doing well, and you're just not. He says, for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he looks at himself, he beholds himself, and he goes his way, and straightway he forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks in the perfect law of liberty, and he continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It is possible to come and to look the word of God in the face, the mirror, and have the mirror show us who we are. This is the sin in our life. This is the, the laziness. This is, this is where we need to, to do more for the cause of Christ or you know, to be convicted by the word. It's possible to see it and then walk away to leave through the doors and do nothing about it. To be the exact same person we were when we walked in and to be completely deceived in the process. And that's for the believer. In the book of Revelation, uh, the strongest condemnation is to the church who is rich and seems like they're doing really well. And traditionally, if you're looking at the churches through the ages, that church would describe our age. The problem with that, I think, is that we've got a worldwide church, not just a North American church. However, if we were to look at all of the churches of Revelation, seven churches there, I think we would find that uh, this is the one that most adequately describes where we're at. In North America. In Revelation 3.17, because thou sayest, I am rich and I am increased with goods and I have need of nothing. Okay? Because you think you're okay, you don't see your need, and you're not desperate to change. He says, and you know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's a sad state. For a believer to stay in. And so I was challenged to listen more intently, to beg God to speak through his word and to teach me. So I'm not just the disciples who are going on and and having all these lessons put so clearly in front of me all the time. You know what's interesting about this? As much as we talk about spiritual blindness and, and they got it eventually, it's true. But God is working in us to, both, to, to do his will, right? But we are supposed to work that out. And Jesus doesn't give the disciples a pass. He doesn't say, oh, that's, that's fine. You're not, you're not there yet. He says, no. He says, guys, what's the problem? You're not listening. You're not seeing. You're not hearing. Your, your rationale is messed up. You're not remembering. In other words, there's something you need to start doing better so that you're getting it, so that you're growing. And so this is where, hopefully, we can learn as well. Say, God, teach me. God, show me. God, allow your word to change me. Beg God to speak to us through his word once again. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for for this time we've had together. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you can use this story to encourage us, to to show us that the the difficulty that we experience in trying to get um, truth 
into the hearts and minds of other people is one that, that Christ shared, um, that so often his disciples, um, his pupils did not listen and understand well. And so God, I pray you'd encourage us to keep going and to keep giving your word and just praying that the Spirit of God uses it to change lives. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd show us areas of our life that we are ignorant, that we are blind, that we are thinking irrationally, that we are not applying your word properly. Lord, there are so many people here that have so much knowledge of truth. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just be a knowledgeable people, that we'd be a transformed people by the Spirit of God, doing the will of God in our lives. And so God, show us what we need to know. We love you, we thank you, we pray it all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.